Okay, good morning, everyone. Let's uh, get started. Um, everyone is now uh, neck deep in their final project, hopefully. So I will try at the beginning of most classes for a few minutes to just talk about tips and tricks. So for some of you, depending on what the project you're working on, you're gonna have to get down into the engine room of the physics engine and play around with some things that we haven't really played around with yet uh, in, uh, in the assignments. One of them uh, came up a couple times this week is joint ranges. So at the moment, the range at which the joint uh, operates is fixed. If you remember back to our discussion about physics engines, when you initially define the links and the joints that connect links together, at whatever, wherever the, whatever the orientation is or the positions of the links are, the moment you connect them with the joint, at the first time step of the simulation, the angle of that joint is zero, right? Looks like it's 90 degrees, it's not 90 degrees, it's zero. If I create a link like this and a link like this and I attach them with the joint, this at time step zero, the angle of this joint is zero, right? For uh, just for, uh, to make things easy for us, we came up with this convention where uh, flexion, so uh, joints that rotate body parts in towards the body, those are negative angles and extension are positive angles away from zero that rotate the body part or the link away from the starting angle of zero, yeah? Okay, if you, uh, if you go into the PyroSim directory, let me make this a little bigger here so everyone can see. If you enter the PyroSim uh, directory and you open the file called joint.py, you will see inside joint.py there is a function called uh, save. And just again, another reminder, the physics engine that we're using in this class is PyBullet. This is an off-the-shelf, downloadable physics engine. You're using PyroSim, which is a wrapper that I wrote in, uh, in uh, Python that hides a lot of the details about PyBullet from you. Now we're gonna to have to expose some of those details. So what PyroSim is doing in this case is taking various aspects, various features of your joint, like the name of the joint, what's the parent link, what's the child link, and packaging that up and writing it out into a file in the file format that PyBullet, the underlying physics engine, understands, right? Rather than you have to learning all the formatting and the file formats for PyBullet, I just kind of hid a lot of that from you. So you'll notice there's some hard-coded values in what's being written out to the PyBullet file, like, for example, the lower and upper range of the joint, right? So at the, uh, the, range, the ranges are described in radians, so minus, uh, minus pi radians and plus pi plus pi radians, yeah? You can go into joint.py and replace these with variables, and if you do, you then need to change the constructor for joint.py so that when in, uh, in PyroSim you define a joint, you now have to give it two more numbers, two more parameters, which are the lower and upper joint ranges. And then that gets saved into joint.py and it'll be written out to the file. Question? Didn't we have um, joint range of motion and then constant already? I don't think so, unless you unless you made this change already. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. Oh. We enforced it at a different level of the program. Though. Oh, really? Just making sure that the neurons weren't sending anything ah. outside that range. Okay, great point. That's it. So the motor neuron. I think you're 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 uh, you scale the value of the motor neuron to a value between. I'm guessing probably minus 3.14159 and plus 3.14159. We scale it by like 0 0.01. Okay, I was wrong then. All right. Okay, so I was trying to hide this detail from you, but let's go one level down. Okay, there are soft and hard limits in most uh, physics engines. Yeah, so 
my, your, your ankle and your knee has hard limits and you don't want to go beyond those limits that are enforced by the physiology. Yeah? That's what these numbers represent. The physics engine will not allow your joints to go beyond these ranges. Yeah? Continuing the metaphor, your muscles you know, will allow you to rotate within the hard limits. If you don't do yoga every day and you don't stretch, the range at which you can actually rotate your joints become narrower and narrower. The hard limits more or less stay the same. Yeah? So there are soft and hard limits in biology, in physiology, same thing in the physics engine. Yeah? So you can think about the ranges in uh, your motor neurons. You can scale them so that they'll rotate any, uh, uh, through any subset of minus uh, pi radians to plus pi radians, but that's it, right? You might need to go beyond minus pi radians or plus pi radians. Why? Seems a little odd, right? Seems like it's more than enough for most purposes. Yeah. Wheels, right? If you have wheels, you might want to remove these limits altogether. Some of you have sort of a, a turret or a rotating arm on top of your robot. You might want it to rotate three or four times counterclockwise or clockwise or whatever evolution comes up with. Same thing, you want to have wider ranges. Yeah? You might also want to have narrower hard limits depending on what you're, what you're doing. Make sense? Soft and hard limits? Okay, that was one thing I wanted to go over. The other thing I wanted to go over, uh, there was again some confusion about, the, uh, about time scales in physics engines. Not surprisingly, it's a little confusing. There are multiple time scales that are at work in your code base. Let's start with the slowest time scale, which is what? Change is happening within your code when you run it. What's the slowest? rate of change. If you start your evolutionary algorithm, you run it for a few minutes or a few hours, what is changing over those few minutes or few hours? What the screens look like? Uh, possibly. If you're doing evolution for a few minutes or a few hours, you're probably turning off the, the simulator. So what's happening in the simulator are actually faster time scales. What is changing from one simulation to the next? Or one generation to the next as you evolve your robots? Yep, idea? Uh, I was thinking that the like, um, uh, IO stuff might be a bottleneck. The, the IO, so stuff is being written to, to disk, yeah. The, the description of your robot, the set of synaptic weights, what's in the genome? is changing slowly over a few minutes and a few hours as a result of mutations, right? So evolutionary change is sort of the slowest time scale in terms of the things that are changing in your code base, yeah? Okay, next one, as you mentioned, is a single simulation itself, right? You start up a simulation and it runs for 1,000 time steps, 10,000 time steps, some of you might have started to play with the total number of time steps. So in your constants file, I think at this point, you should have some variable called number of time steps, which is the total amount of time that you're going to evaluate your robot for, that you're going to simulate your robot for and evaluate it for. Yeah? Let's set it to 1,000. Inside this particular physics engine, there is also a constant which you haven't seen yet, which is the amount of time that elapses in the simulation between one time step and the next, right? We talked about this last time, that time is discrete in a physics engine, right? As far as we know here in the real world, time changes continuously. The amount of time that's passing between one time step and the next is 1 240th of a second. Yeah? Okay. I went through this with one of you uh, earlier this week, uh, or last week. Let's just, for our purposes, pretend it's uh, a two, 200, 1 250th of a second. If we have a thousand, if we're going to simulate a thousand time steps, how much time elapses in the physics engine? 
four seconds, right? This number times this number. So the total amount of time that passes in the physics engine is four seconds, yeah? If you change the number of time steps to this, you're now simulating the robot for 40 seconds in the physics engine, yeah? Let's go back to four seconds. If you run a simulation with the graphics turn on and you watch what happens, how long does that last? How long, how long is the period of time at which the simulation starts up? You watch it, the simulation runs, and then shuts off again. I'm sorry, just to yep. clarify. Yes. So if you reduce the time step interval, Yep. Um, this, this number, the time step interval, yep. You are increasing the amount of time that you're simulating? Good question. So you could actually reduce the time, this is a good, good question, this time step interval, why would you want to do such a thing? Some of you might actually want to do this. It's, it's down in the guts of Pi Bullet, the physics engine. You can change it. Any ideas? If you're doing something that goes really fast, you want to avoid tunneling? Absolutely. We talked about the example of shooting two bullets at one another. 200, one, 250th of a second, 250th of a second later, there, there's a jump between, and if those objects are small enough and moving fast enough, they could actually pass through one another. And the collision detection and resolution algorithm could miss that event. If you make this value lower, you're changing, you're, you're reducing the amount of change that happens in the physics engine from one time step to the next. It makes your, it makes your physics engine more accurate. So let's reduce, let's imagine we do go into the code and we make the time interval lower, which means we make our simulation more accurate, but we left this the same. How much time are we now simulating in the physics engine? Two seconds, right? So obviously by making our, our physical simulation more accurate, we've given something up. We can compensate for that by doing this. And now we're back to simulating four seconds of physics in the physics engine. Yeah, but we have to give something up if we're now making a more accurate simulation of four seconds of time. What have we given up here? There's always a cost, no free lunch. Computing speed, I suppose. Computing speed, right? So there are actually three time scales at work when you're running one simulation. We just talked about the first time scale, which is the amount of time that's going on inside the physics engine. There is a second time scale. There's no clock in this room. If there was, I'd point to it and say the second time scale is wall clock time. It's the actual amount of time it takes your laptop to simulate this, right? If you've got an older laptop, it, it's probably gonna take at least this amount of time, if not more, to simulate four seconds of simulation time, yeah? It's a relatively new MacBook Pro. If I did this on my laptop, I could probably simulate it in less than four second time. I could probably use less wall clock time to simulate this amount of simulation time. So far, so good? Simulation time, wall clock time, there's a third time scale that's still at, that's at play when you actually visualize the simulator. This is all assuming we have the graphics all turned off. If we turn the graphics on, simulation window comes up, we watch the simulation, and then it turns off. How long does that take? If you remember all the way back towards the beginning of the assignment, uh, of the assignments, you had this for loop, and inside this for loop, you put a time.sleep command for, for example, one sixtieth of a second. Yeah? Every iteration through this for loop is one time step. You're actually slowing things down. Why? Why did we do that all the way back at the beginning? So we could visually see what was going on. Because 
the clock that runs in here has a limit as well, right? You needed to slow down the animation, the rate at which the drawn frames, one frame per time step, was shown to you. And for some of you, you might have changed this number, slowed it down, sped it up. Let's assume we have all of these parameters in there now. How long, and assuming we're sleeping for this amount, how long does it take this simulation to run with the graphics turned on? Okay, it's this multiplied by this. 33 seconds? <laughs> I haven't had enough caffeine this morning. This number times this number, whatever it is, that's how long it takes, right? If we slowed things down, let's make things easier on ourselves. Let's imagine we, uh, we ran the simulation at one frame per second. We're gonna see one image per second. We're gonna sleep for one second for each time step. We've got 2,000 time steps. It's going to take 2,000 seconds to watch this animation. Yeah. So we've got now the graphics time scale as well, which you can run faster or slower uh, as you see fit. Yeah. OK. So time is a little bit confusing in uh, your code base. So you actually have sort of four time scales. Slowest one is evolutionary change. This is usually the next slowest one because you want to watch how things are going. If you turn off the graphics, things will run faster. This is how long they're actually, you're actually simulating it for. And depending on the speed of your computer, it will simulate this amount of physics faster than four seconds or slower than four seconds. Question. So the way that you've been saying, it just sounds like the sleep time scale is independent of the, um, like the one over 500 seconds time scale. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, this has absolutely nothing to do with this. I'm this is completely independent. I, I just wonder why that's the case, because like, aren't you sleeping, um, updating the simulation? So like, the thing you're not updating when you sleep. You're not you're not updating or slowing down the simulation. You're slowing down the rate at which you watch the simulation. The simulation runs this much this much time between time steps for this total time. You can change this. This is independent of these. Yeah. If I go out in the hall and run up and down the hall, and you come out and record me running with your, with your phone, physics is elapsing at a certain rate in the real world. That's this. Once you've made a video of me running up and down the hall, you can play back your video at different frame rates. You can slow up the video, you can slow it down. It has absolutely no impact on the physics whatsoever. Yeah. So when you're running the graphics, that's in essence what you're doing. There's a virtual camera that is playing back the, these physics. All good? Okay. All right. Uh, if anyone else has any questions, things that are confusing, or the things you need to change in the physics engine that we haven't talked about, let me know, and we'll talk about it for a few minutes at the beginning of class. OK. Speaking of simulation, uh, simulation is wonderful, but it doesn't provide us any guarantees that what we evolve in simulation will transfer to reality. So we looked, uh, we went back to the mid-'90s and looked at the very first attempt to cross the sim to real gap. Worked pretty well for the little hockey puck wheeled Kepra robot. That's a simple robot, simple simulation. We uh, ended last time by looking at the Golem project from the year 2000 that used two brand new technologies, physics engines and 3D printers. The Golem project had, uh, had a number of goals. One of them was to try and cross the sim to real gap. And the other one was not just to automate design through evolutionary algorithms, which you're doing in your, uh, in your code base, but also to try and automate manufacture. The hope in the Golem project was that they would be able to print uh, an evolved robot that would walk out of the 3D printer. 23 years later today, that, that goal still exists. Several labs are getting closer, but no one's been able to do it quite yet. Yeah. OK. Uh, it did not quite solve the sim to real gap uh, for various reasons. Um, and we're going to talk about 
uh, the Resilient Machines Project today, which took place in 2006, which, which was an attempt to build on the Golem Project and the Radical Envelope of Noise Hypothesis. And the lead investigator on this project, the Resilient Machines Project, was yours truly. So allow me to walk you through my humble contribution to evolutionary robotics. Let me start by uh, reminding you of this slide that we saw at the beginning uh, of the semester. Robots have been around for since the 1970s in factories, in controlled environments where robots do the same thing over and over again. That's a solved problem. Creating autonomous and adaptive machines, still very difficult. I don't, I don't think any of us were driven to campus this morning in an autonomous car. It's not, not here yet, right? Much, much more difficult because uh, as we were reminded, man never enters the same river twice. Yeah? The environment around machines and organisms changes all the time. So we need to be able to create machines that continuously adapt their mode of operation as the world around them changes. And this point seems to be the thing that is most holding up robotics. Very difficult. Yeah? One of my observations when I started to learn about this field and thinking about uh, machines and comparing them to biological machines, us, where we seem to do a very good job of adapting to the world around us, I, I was thinking about what, what's missing. What is it? Why are organisms so good at doing this and machines not so good at doing this? One difference um, between organisms and machines is that the internal environment of organisms changes all the time. Everyone sitting in this room, we all started as single cells, and you managed to keep yourself alive as one cell became two, became four, became eight, became 16, became 32, became the 10 to the 15 or 10 to the 16 cells that make up you at the moment. If you can do that, if you can keep yourself alive as your internal environment changes over 15 or 16 orders of magnitude, being able to clean up a, this construction site and then clean up a different construction site, the amount of difference between two construction sites, that's minor. That amount of change is minor compared to the amount of change that you have personally experienced during development. So that led me uh, to think about uh, robots that are experiencing internal change. Can we make machines that deal with internal change? And if they can do that, maybe they'll, they'll find it much easier to deal with external change. So far, so good? OK, that's the background to the Resilient Machines Project. And these videos no longer exist. That's going to be problematic. I think we'll see them. We'll see them a little bit later. Let me turn off the light so at least you can see a little bit what's going on here. You're going to. Uh, I'm going to. This is sort of a summary of what you're going to see. We've got a four-legged uh, robot here. Um, we're going to use an evolutionary algorithm and a physics engine to evolve controllers for it in simulation. And then when this physical robot uses those evolved controllers, it walks from the left side of the table to the right side of the table. Then we went in and introduced internal change, which is that we sent in a graduate student with a screwdriver, and he mechanically separated off or pulled off uh, the motor and the right lower leg. This robot experiences that something has happened, something has changed. This robot is going to then pause, diagnose what's gone wrong, and try and come up with a compensating way of moving. The way it moved, the controller that allowed it to move with four legs is no longer going to work once it realizes that it's only got three and a half legs. So it's going to re-evolve a new controller that allows it to walk in its new three and a half legged uh, configuration. So this is a robot that grapples not with external change, but what with internal change. Yeah? That's the summary, and we're going to look at the details of how this was accomplished in a moment. So far, so good? OK, hopefully we'll see these videos uh, in a minute or two. OK, again, just to uh, recap 
what we've seen so far in this class. We've seen three existing approaches to evolutionary robotics. Way back at the beginning, when physics engines didn't exist, uh, researchers evolved controllers directly on the physical robot, on the Kepra or other uh, simple physical robots. The drawback of that, of course, is that it requires hundreds and thousands of physical evaluations unfolding over days or weeks. It's painstaking manual labor to reset the robot takes a long time. There's a lot of wear and tear, obviously, on the robot if you're trying out to, uh, hundreds or thousands or millions of trials on a physical machine. So around 2000, when physics engines started to appear, roboticists very quickly migrated to physical simulation, whereas we've seen in the bulk of the experiments in this course, do all, the do all the evolution and simulation, and then attempt to transfer to reality. The drawback of this approach, of course, is that first of all, it requires a human to handcraft a simulator. You spent the first 10 weeks, more or less, building a simulator for a particular type of robot. Second problem is if you then take the next step and try and send whatever you've evolved to reality, it doesn't always transfer. Yeah. There's a third approach, which we actually, I don't think we've talked about in this class. It's, it's sort of fallen out of favor which is to uh, create, uh, by hand, create an original controller for the robot that's not perfect. Use human intuition as best you can to come up with a kind of okay controller and then allow AI or an evolutionary algorithm to tune or improve that controller on the physical robot. It's fallen out of favor because as pr hopefully you've been convinced by now in this course, Human intuition doesn't get you very far in actually writing down the synaptic weights for a neural controller for a robot, yeah? Okay, so three approaches, all of them have a bit of a drawback. So when I was working at Cornell, we came up with uh, the estimation exploration algorithm, not the most creative uh, name, or the EEA. It's also uh, not a perfect name because it doesn't capture everything this algorithm does. This algorithm, as we're gonna see in a moment, contains three different evolutionary algorithms that do three different things. The first evolutionary algorithm is gonna allow the robot to use its experiences to evolve an accurate simulator. We've talked in this course a fair bit about how do you get the friction coefficient for the floor in the simulator right? What should be the strength of the motors? What should be the amount of time that passes inside the simulation? Very difficult for us to determine what all these values should be. As you're gonna see in a moment, you're gonna see an evolutionary algorithm in a moment that evolves not populations of neural controllers, it's gonna evolve populations of physics engines where what's going on in any one physics engine is a little bit different from what's going on in the next physics engine. This is known as estimation, where the robot is gonna use its physical experiences to optimize a physics engine, a simulator, to best reflect reality, yeah? So this is not actually sim to real. This is real to sim. We're gonna collect experiences from the real world and the robot is gonna evolve a model or evolve a simulation of itself and its environment, yeah? Going back to uh, neuroscience for a moment, there's a lot of interesting research about the fact that whether and if so, how we do that, yeah? You could close your eyes right now and simulate what happens at the end of this class. You can imagine yourself folding up your uh, notebooks, putting them in your backpack, walking to the door, reaching for the handle without moving from your seat. You can imagine it. What kind of physics engine is running in your head to allow you to do that? It's still not clear, yeah? Okay. Second evolutionary algorithm that we're going to see is uh, an evolutionary algorithm that is basic, gives the robot curiosity. 
If the robot is going to collect experiences, the physical robot is going to move about in its world, get real world data, and use that to evolve a simulator, what? What experiences, what should it do in the real world to learn about the real world? Turns out it's not trivial what it should do. One good thing to do is be curious. Try lots of different things. So we're going to use a second evolutionary algorithm to evolve things for the physical robot to do in the real world. Not to accomplish a task, but to collect information about the real world. Yeah? Around this time of year, if you're not sure whether there's ice or mud in front of you, you might reach out and push with your foot a little bit, right? You're exploring about a meter or two in front of you what's out there, and then based on what you discover, you choose how to, how to proceed. Yeah? Third evolution, the third evolutionary algorithm we're going to see is the one that's going to be most familiar to you. This is the one that's going to evolve uh, that's going to evolve controllers in the, ev the evolved simulator. The best simulator from the first evolutionary algorithm that best reflects reality. So far, so good? So estimation, exploration, and exploiting the physics that the robot has learned so far in order to evolve a controller to do whatever it is we originally asked the robot to do. Okay, let's look at these three evolutionary algorithms in turn. We're going to start with the estimation algorithm. This evolutionary algorithm is going to try and evolve uh, a simulation of the robot itself. It's going to evolve, in this case, as you're going to see, not just the, not, not the parameters of the physics engine, but how the parts of the robot are actually simulated in the physics engine. We're going to treat this robot as a baby. It doesn't know much about the world around it, and it also doesn't know much about its own body. You might remember when we talked about cog and baby bot that was pushing against the pieces of fruit. It was trying to learn about its own body and the world around it. Same thing here. We're going to tell this physical robot. It's got a torso, and it's got these uh, eight other pieces. But we're not going to tell the robot how these pieces are put together. This robot has no camera, so it can't see itself. A good way to think about this evolutionary algorithm is imagine I put you in a big machine. I put you inside a control box. And inside that control box, there were eight levers in front of you. You could pull on any of those levers. And when you pulled on one of those levers, you would feel the whole machine tilting uh, in response to whatever lever you pulled. You can't see outside this, uh, this control box. But you can sense how you move when you pull on these levers. What are these levers meant to represent in this metaphor? Motors, right? So the robot is going to be able to send commands to motor 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, or 8. And the physical robot is going to uh, feel how much it tilts left and right and how much it tilts forward and back. So this robot has eight motors and two sensors, left, right tilt, and forward and back tilt. What are these sensors called? You also have two of them. Where are they? I'm not sure what they're called, yeah. but I know it's for us it's a fluid tilt module in the ears. That's it, right? This is your vestibular sense, right? As you rotate your head, the fluid sloshes around uh, in your ear canals, and you can feel how your, how your head is changing relative to gravity. That's the vestibular sense. How you're oriented relative to the ground, or how you're uh, oriented relative to down or gravity, very important sense organ, as you can imagine. Yeah? So eight motors, two vestibular sensors in this case. OK. At the very beginning, I'm going to show you a whole bunch of videos, hopefully these videos work, that are going to walk you through this experiment. We're starting right at the beginning. None of these three evolutionary algorithms have started running yet. 
We're going to start not with sim, we're going to start with real. We have this robot here. Again, it knows it has eight motors, uh, and it knows it has two sensors, but it doesn't know how its body is put together. It's got to get some experience from the real world to start to learn about its own body and how it relates to the real world. Given how little this robot knows about itself or the world around it, what should this robot do? Nothing. nothing? It could do nothing. What's it going to learn if it does nothing? Mm -hmm. Nothing. OK. So nothing is out. It's got to do something. It could move every single joint. It, so if you're inside the box and you know nothing and you pull all eight levers and you shake all over the place, what have you learned? Also nothing. OK, so that's out. Don't do nothing and don't do everything. One at a time. Maybe. One at a time. In this case, we let, we let the robot do pull on one lever or two levers. For various, I won't go into the details. So which levers to pull? This robot doesn't know much. Pull at random. Yeah. So at the very beginning of this experiment, uh, the code running inside the robot, uh, we generated two random numbers, two random integers, which came up as 1 and 5, which cause motors 1 and motors 5, so the shoulder and the elbow in the left arm, to rotate down and all the other six motors rotate up, and the robot tilts to the right. So the robot rotated motors one and five down, all the other motors up, and the robot felt itself tip to the right thanks to its vestibular sensors. What can the robot conclude about motors one and five? You're in a machine, you pull lever one and five down, and you feel yourself tilt to the right. They're, on the left side. They're somewhere on the left side, right? OK. You can imagine this game becomes pretty complicated pretty quickly. So surprise, surprise, we turned over this task to an evolutionary algorithm. So we're now going to watch the estimation evolutionary algorithm, which is going to try and estimate the physics of the robot and its environment. And it's going to do that. What you're watching in this video now is the beginning of this evolutionary algorithm running. It is searching over the space of all possible ways to build its own body. It's trying to figure out how it's put together. Yeah. OK, so what you're watching is the phenotype, right, the robot. Remember, there's a genotype. There's something that's encoding the robot. In your code, your genotype is a vector that encodes synaptic weights. In this evolutionary algorithm, the vector is a vector of integers. Element 1 corresponds to body, body part 1, and, it, and it, it indicates what other body part it should be attached to. Yeah. So we have a vector of length 8, which corresponds to the 8 uh, pieces. The ninth piece is the main body here. And the integer in each of those 8 slots says, connect me to that other, to the other body part. So far, so good? Genotype and phenotype? OK. What's the fitness? What do you think the fitness function is in this evolutionary algorithm, given what I've told you so far about this experiment? Hopefully it's not locomotion, because this robot's not really going anywhere anytime soon. Did you have an idea? Yeah, you tested for like what you're comparing to is like the sensor values in the um, like the pitch and yaw or whatever. It would be matching those. Absolutely, right? So remember the physical robot has performed one action and got back one sensory repercussion. It's got back two numbers, which is how much it tilted left and right and how much it tilted forward and back. Yeah? So roll and pitch. Yeah? We put two virtual vestibular sensors on the main body of this robot, and it's evolving a simulation so that the virtual vestibular sensation is as close to the physical vestibular sensation as possible. Yeah, makes sense. We're trying to minimize that difference. Yeah. 
If you watch this video carefully, you'll notice in all of the uh, in all of these short simulations that you're seeing, the green box is actually rotating forward. This is a result of my poor camera work in the physics engine. I should have shot this video from the right hand side so that you would see in the video the green box tilting a little bit to the right. Yeah. So very quickly in this evolutionary algorithm, it starts to discover ways to build the robot's body to minimize the difference between virtual and physical sensor data. This is actually a super simple thing for the evolutionary algorithm to do. There's an obvious problem at this point. What is it? Has the robot discovered how it's put together yet? What's the problem? Not the unfair placement of the like, motors and different joints and stuff. Yeah, the placements are all wrong, right? Now, the robot doesn't know that because it can't see itself. What, what does the robot know at this point? This is the evolutionary algorithm running. It, it only knows that motors one and five make it go tilt to the right, and it doesn't know what the rest of its body is doing. It doesn't know what the rest of its body is doing, and it also doesn't know exactly where on the right-hand side, or sorry, where on the left-hand side motors one and five should be. I can't remember which colors here correspond to one and five. I think pink is five. You see it more or less on the, on the right-hand side over here. Again, sorry about my camera work. So at this point, the robot is, I'm anthropomorphizing here, but the robot is saying to itself, I've got 17 completely different descriptions of my own body, and they all corroborate my physical experiences. The robot knows enough to, to say, I can't simultaneously be built in all these different ways. Yeah? So given that fact, the robot says, I have seven different, 17 different models of myself, simulations of myself. They're all different. They all have maximum fitness. What should the robot conclude and then do given that fact? It should conclude that it needs more data. It needs more data and it should do something. So we, we started in real, we went to sim, we're gonna go back, we're gonna go back to real. This is what the robot does next. I forget which motors these are. I think it's, uh, it's rotating just, oh, it's rotating two motors down and it tilts a little bit now to the left. Less to the left than it did to the right. Yeah. So it's got now two experiences. It's pushed against the world twice and, got a, and gotten sensory repercussions back twice. It's got two data points from the real world. What does the robot do next? Back to sim, right? Now the robot is running every simulation twice. Once with the first set of actions, and then again with the second set of actions, which generates two pieces of virtual sensor data. And we have two physical sensor events, sensory repercussions. It's got to minimize the difference between both of these experiences. It's got to minimize the difference between the sensory repercussions from both of these experiences. So far, so good? Okay, so in this first evolutionary algorithm, we're bouncing back and forth between, alternating back and forth between simulation, reality, simulation, reality. I, I, I told a fib here. This isn't actually the second uh, experience it collects. I've jumped ahead to the eighth experience. Yeah? The reason why is because in this particular uh, round, during this eighth round, the robot had its eureka moment. This is the eighth time that we've run this first evolutionary algorithm. What happens during this evolutionary process? It gets the right model. It gets the right model. So at the beginning of this video, it's got these, uh, it's got these models, which are explaining maybe three of the eight, four of the eight experiences. 
These simulations are mutating over evolutionary time. We've got a population of these simulations. And suddenly, a simulation appears, which is this one. It's got three of the four legs right, which suddenly explains six out of the eight experiences. That, obvious, that particular simulation gets way higher fitness than all the other simulations in the population. So within a couple more generations, that simulation drives all the other inaccurate simulations to extinction, produces randomly modified copies of itself, including the final one, which is this one, which now explains eight out of the eight experiences. Again, I'm simplifying. It doesn't quite explain all eight. It's, it's not getting a maximum fitness here. There are still some inaccuracies. Even this last simulation, if you watch carefully, the, the legs are in the right place, but they're bent. Yeah? So the robot says, I should probably be careful. Let's go back for a ninth, a ni a ninth go round. This is not the ninth. This is the 16th round. Yeah? The robot's getting a little tired. We're getting a little bit tired. 16th round and getting the 16th sensory repercussion back to simulation for the 16th round and this is what's happening in the evolutionary algorithm at this time fitness is no longer increasing what does the robot know and not know at this time given what you can see in this, in these simulations. Can't seem to evolve any higher fitness. Is the robot right? I see sort of some, yeah, kind of, right? The model isn't perfect. You'll notice the legs are still bent. Between the 8th and the 16th iteration, it collected a lot more experience and basically <laughs> seemed to convince itself that the legs are bent. The legs are definitely not bent. W what's going on here? Took us a little bit. We were scratching our heads over this. I spent almost a month trying to debug my code at this point, thinking something was wrong. Nothing's wrong. What's going on here? Is it because it, <clears throat> it, it evolved initially in the four-legged model that with the curved legs, but it doesn't in the actual model have any curve sensing to like fix itself? Uh, close. So there's things it can, can and can't sense in the real world, right? It's got just these two vestibular sensors, but the vestibular sensors seem to be giving back data in response to actions for which curved legs in this simulation seem to support those experiences, but, but why? I mean, yes, it can't directly sense that there is lack of curvature in the legs. It uh, doesn't have sensors on like the knees, yeah. so it doesn't know how they should, like which way they should bend or if they should at all. Uh, that's true, right? It doesn't know whether they should bend or not, but it seems pretty convinced that the red leg is curved to the right. There isn't data coming back saying, maybe it's curved to the left, maybe it's not curved, maybe it's curved to the right. All 16 experiences say, can be explained best by a red leg that's bent to the right. Why? Look at the physical robot. Obviously it doesn't have bent legs. What else? Ideas? When it's reading that sensor and it's tilted, the leg in physical space actually is sort of tilted to the right? Uh, it, it could be. It could be that when it stands up, like the leg bends a little bit. There are some narrow parts to the leg, so it might be that they're actually bending a little bit. A, a little bit, but not this much. Um, I think it might be that the center of the square isn't exactly like the center of the robot, like the, the ankle. The mass distribution is not symmetric. There's a, uh, there's a heavy battery on board. This, we did this work in 2006, so battery technology wasn't great at the time. The mass distribution is off. 
If I put you in a big machine and you started pull on the levers and there was a heavy weight on one side of the machine, you would generally tend to tilt to the right. But in, a, in this evolutionary algorithm, there's nothing in the genome where you can encode or change the mass distribution. If you remember back when we were seeing the evolved passive dynamic walker, there were virtual lead weights that the evolutionary algorithm could move around to approximate mass distribution. It doesn't exist here, so the evolutionary algorithm does the best it can with what we allowed it to evolve, which is how the body parts are connected together. This model, the self model, is wrong, uh, which made us very nervous at the beginning, but hold on to this fact. Okay, so this is the end of part one. This first of three evolutionary algorithms has run and evolved a simulator. There it is. That's the robot's best understanding of itself. I'm gonna skip over the second evolutionary algorithm, which is the exploration part. I'll come back to that in a moment. Let's skip ahead to the third evolutionary algorithm, which is the exploitation algorithm, which is gonna exploit this physics engine to evolve controllers, neural controllers for what we want the physical robot to do, which is to walk from the left side of the table to the right side of the table, yeah? This is exactly what you were doing in assignment 10. Yeah? No, dif no difference here except, in this case, I didn't make the simulator, the evolutionary algorithm made the simulator for me. Okay. Oh, this is too bad. Okay, let me, let me this you, you need to see, so let me jump to YouTube and see if I can find it. Okay. Okay, here's the video you just saw. Okay, cross our fingers, try that gate in reality. And it works okay. So I spent three years working on this project for, what was that, four seconds of video? Took us a very long time took us a very long time to get all, work out all the kinks of these three evolutionary algorithms, get them to work together. It uh, wasn't working, wasn't working, couldn't cross the sim to real gap. Evolutionary algorithm couldn't, couldn't reverse engineer a self-model. About two and a half years into this three-year project, three in the morning, finally got this video, we got it to work. Myself and the two other, my two other colleagues that were working on this project, as you can imagine, we went absolutely bananas. We were jumping up and down. There was an undergraduate who was working in the lab at three in the morning on a completely unrelated project, sitting at another de desk, obviously is wondering what the heck is going on, turns around, looks at us, looks at this thing moving across the table and says, dude, that's the evil starfish. <laughs> so for better, for worse, uh, formally this is known as the Resilient Machines Project, but most people in the field now know this as the evil starfish project, for obvious reasons. Okay, questions? So far, so good? Okay. Like the Golem Project, you're gonna see here, uh, like the Golem Project, this particular project, uh, we kept going, so we crossed the sim to real gap, but what we were interested in, as I mentioned at the beginning of today's lecture, is how you, we can create machines that grapple with internal change, and if they can do that, maybe they will be ready to grapple with external change, yeah? So now we have a robot that has a model of itself, and it can use that model of self to evolve controllers to do what we want it to do, move to the left, move to the right, and so on. But what happens if the wor robot's internal world changes? So as I, as I prefaced for this lecture, we're going to now introduce an unanticipated internal change. 
It's not the world that's going to change. It's the robot's own body that's going to change. You just saw the robot walking from the left to the right-hand side of the table. Every once in a while, this, robot, this robot's a little cautious. Every once in a while, it'll stop and replay at random one of those 16 uh, actions it performed earlier. And here it is performing one of those uh, 16 actions that it performed earlier. But now it gets a different result. Before, when it pulled lever three and seven down, it would tilt 40 degrees to the left. But now, when it pulls levers three and seven down, it only tilts 20 degrees to the left. What can the robot conclu conclude about that? You obviously know what's happened. The robot doesn't. It's got those two vestibular sensors. Either its body or environment changed. Its body or its environment changed, yeah? In future ex later experiments, we looked at allowing the robot to model itself and its environment. In this first experiment, we helped the robot. We, we ruled that out. We said, your environment hasn't changed. You've changed. How? How does the robot know how its body has changed? It discards the old uh, version of this experience and replaces it with this experience and this new reper repercussion. Yeah. So now it's got its train. It's still got its training set with 16 experiences and 16 sensory repercussions. One of them is new. What does the robot do? It's cautious. It knows something has changed, so it's not going to keep trying to walk to the right-hand side of the table. What do you think the robot is going to do? It should try the other things to make a new model first. It's got to make, it's got to make a new model, right? So here we go. At the beginning of this video, the robot thinks it's a four-legged robot, which makes sense because it just most recently was. Uh, one other detail I forgot to mention is uh, we were evolving in this case not just how the pieces were put together, but the sizes of the pieces. Seems like an odd thing to do. The sizes, the sizes of the physical robot aren't going to change. What does the robot do with this added degree of freedom? We published this paper, and as you can imagine, we got a lot of media uh, attention at this self-modeling robot. It's conscious. It knows about itself. We had a lot of responses. We had one response from a dream psychologist who said, oh, it's obvious. The robot is dreaming. Yeah? It dreams that its right-hand leg has shrunk. Okay? That dream lasts for a little while, but then that dream dies out because the dream is actually an evolved simulator which explains actually quite a bit of the data, but not quite as well as the last, uh, the last simulation you're going to see, which is that the pink, uh, the upper pink part of the leg is fine, and the bottom half of the pink leg has shrunk to almost zero. Also wrong, but it actually approximates what's actually going on pretty well. Yeah. Okay, dreaming machines is sort of back in fashion now in, in deep learning. It makes sense for this machine to generate all these crazy ideas and then with this evolutionary algorithm sort of filter them out to a slightly less crazy idea, which actually seems to explain all 16 experiences pretty well. Yeah? If it's not sure, if it can't converge on one consistent description of itself, go do a 17th action, add that to the training set, and keep going, yeah? Okay, so we end now with this simulation, which is that the robot has three and a half legs. It starts up the third evolutionary algorithm again, which is just evolving neural controllers. And the neural controller that evolved before, that worked for the four-legged robot, gets very low fitness, gets very low fitness on this new machine. It's uh, driven to extinction in the population of evolving controllers and is replaced by controllers that cause the robot to do this. 
which is also another example of perverse instantiation because we're evolving the robot to move to the right as quickly as possible, which it does. But because this is perverse instantiation, it does it in a way that we don't want it to do, which is what? A curve. Walk, walk, right, walk in a curve, and it ends the simulation facing backwards. OK. OK. OK, here we go. So the robot knows that it has about three and a half legs. It's evolved this controller that it thinks will work for its new three and a half legged configuration. Okay, not the most efficient walker you've ever seen, but good enough. Questions? Yes? Why does the like, blue leg change size? Yeah, exactly. So it didn't only change the pink leg. Why did the other parts change? It's wrong, it's wrong and not wrong. Obviously, those other legs didn't change. Those other legs didn't change. What changed? What changed for the physical robot when it went from being a physical four-legged robot to a physical three-and-a-half-legged robot? The weight distribution changed. Mass distribution changed again, and for whatever reason that I'm not smart enough to understand, that's best approximated by the slight changes in volume and mass and size and geometry that it made to the other body parts. Yeah. So for me in particular, this was an emotional roller coaster ride of an experiment over three years. Uh, periods of depression, which is that the robot insisted uh, that it was this when it was actually this. It was not just wrong, but it was collecting more and more data, which seemed to support its wrong conclusion, right? Partway through this project, this seemed like game over for me. This was not going to work. The exhilarating and optimistic part of this is that apparently machines can cross the sim to real gap, even if their simulations aren't perfect, yeah? You can close your eyes and simulate packing up all your stuff and walking to the door and opening the door. Whatever physics engine or whatever model is running in your head, it's probably not perfect. You're making an approximation. But for a lot of the things we do in the real world, it seems to be good enough for coming up with a plan and then executing it, yeah? So this was a big realization for us uh, at the time. Sim to real is hard, but in, in some ways it's actually easier than we might think. You don't need a perfect model to cross the sim to real gap. Yeah? Okay. All right. So uh, as promised, I've talked about the estimation algorithm, which involves populations of simulations, or said differently, populations of self-models. We have the exploitation model, uh, exploitation algorithm down here, evolve neural controllers on the simulated robot. Let's talk, uh, let's talk for a few minutes now about the exploration algorithm. And I'm going to back up a little bit to a slide that I jumped over. Uh, oh, no, I, I, it's ahead. Actually, let me back up here. We can talk about it from here. OK. At this point, early in the robot's experience, it had 17 different models that all, uh, that all match the sensor data. And at this point, the robot is thinking about what to do next, what action to perform to collect a new piece of experience from the real world. It's got eight levers in front of it. It can pull one or two levers at most. Which levers should it pull? Remember that it's just pulled uh, levers one and five and come up with this. What levers should it pull? Let me rephrase it. What should it not do next? What is the worst possible thing it could do next? Pull one and five again. 
pull one and five again, right? It already know, assuming it doesn't break or something doesn't change in its environment, that's the worst possible thing it could do. So what's left? Everything else, right? Are all those other actions, aside from pulling levers one and five, are they all going to be equally informative? Obviously, the way I'm asking this question, the answer is no. Why not? This takes a little bit to wrap your mind around. We know what it shouldn't do, but there's a huge number of things it could do, but they're not all informative. Some of the levers won't be in the same way, so it wouldn't seem as accurate or helpful data, I guess. Yeah, that's, that's right. So some of these pulling of the levers are gonna give more information than not. But, but how do we know, right? Until the, it's, It almost feels like a catch-22. Before the physical robot does something, how does it know which action it should perform to get the most new information back from the real world. I'll give you a hint. The robot is armed with, at this moment in time, 17 different guesses about how its body is put together, and all 17 agree about what will happen if you pull motors one and five. If you pull motors one and five in all of these 17 virtual robots, they all do the same thing in terms of their vestibular sensors. How can the physical robot exploit these 17 self models to come up with what to do next that's going to be most informative? If the worst thing to do causes all the models to disagree, uh, to agree, then the best thing for the robot to do is Whatever causes them to disagree. But how would it know what, what's going to do that? Exactly. How does it know which combination of levers will cause the models to most disagree? We'll answer that question in a moment, but I just want to make sure everybody sees the intuition here. Yeah? If, I pull, uh, if we pull motors three and seven on all 17 machines, machine one might tilt all the way to the left. Machine two might say, you're crazy. It's not tilt to the left. Look, I tilt to the right. That's the answer. That's what's going to happen if the physical robot pulls motors three and seven. Model, self model three says, you're both crazy. It's not left. It's not right. We're going to pitch forward if the physical robot pulls levers three and seven. But how do we find that action? The action that maximizes disagreement in predictions of the self models. When one of these self models, when we actuate one of these virtual robots and it tilts, that's a prediction, right? That's the model making a prediction about what would happen in reality if that happens. So I'm just going to repeat that. An informative action is one that induces the most disagreement among the predictions of all the self models. We'll talk about how we find such informative actions in a moment. But this is, the, this is sort of the heart of this algorithm, this approach to crossing sin to real. All good? OK, so how does, how, do we find, how does the robot find this particular action among the very large set of actions it could perform? It could do random things in the simulation. It could randomly pull levers, or it could randomly generate one or two levers to pull, pull all 17 self-models, see what they say, come up with another random pulling of the levers. Not very efficient. Can we do better than random? What you just described is random search over the space of all possible potential actions. Can we do better than random search over potential actions? Recall the name of this course. Yeah. The third evolutionary algorithm is going to evolve uh, not a neural controller, just actions. Yeah? So the genome now is very short. 
It's either one or two integers. Which single or pair of motors to pull? And the fitness of any one of those actions is what? We're going to evolve. We're going to search over the space of all possible lever pullings to search for the one that maximizes. Did you have an idea? Disagreement. Disagreement, yeah. We're going to evolve actions that maximize disagreement in the predictions of the self models at that time. Yeah? So when I showed you the eighth action, this one, this was not a randomly generated action. This action was uh, evolved against all the self models at the end of the seventh attempt with the first evolutionary algorithm. Right? At this time, this robot had a set of models. It evolved an action and came up with this action, which generated the most disagreement. Yeah? So at this time, there were probably self-models in the population that said, if you do this, you're going to tilt to the left. Other models said, no, 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 we're going to tilt to the right. Other models said, no, 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 we're going to tilt forward. Others said, no, no, we're going to tilt back. Who was right? They all disagree, so they can't all be right. When the physical robot actually performs this action, whichever self-model predicted left tilting, its fitness stays or goes up. All the other self-models that predicted tilting to the right or forward or back or whatever, their fitness dropped. And the self-model that was right produces randomly modified copies of itself to explain, uh, better explain all eight actions at this point. So far, so good? OK, so during this first part of the experiment, when I first talked, to, when I first explained it to you, we were talking about the exploitation algorithm, or sorry, the, uh, the estimation algorithm, the one that's estimating the physics. The estimation algorithm actually alternates back and forth with the exploration that's exploring for new actions to perform. Yeah, so we run estimation, exploration, estimation, exploration, estimation, exploration for 60 alternations. And at the end, we then switch on the third evolutionary algorithm, exploitation, which exploits the self model to evolve neural controllers to get the robot to walk. So far, so good? OK. If you watch these short snippets of this physical robot, it looks like it's choosing actions at random. Um, we've mentioned developmental psychology before, the study of uh, how human uh, infants develop into adults. If you ever watch very young children, they do what's, ca they do what's called motor babbling. It's like verbal babbling, except motor babbling or muscle babbling. Looks like they're doing a lot, a lot of crazy things, grabbing things at random. Theories have existed in developmental psychology for decades that that's what they're doing. They're just trying things at random to see what works. It looks very much like our robot here. It looks like the robot is doing random motor babbling, but we know that is actually not at all what the robot is doing. It's actually doing something very, very systematic. This, what it's doing is also known as infotaxis. You might remember we talked about phototaxis going towards uh, the light, go towards the information. Organisms, for very good reason, do things in the world, not just to eat and reproduce. We do things in the world to learn about the world and to learn about ourselves, to generate information. OK. We've got two minutes left. Got two minutes left. I think we will. I think we'll end there for today. It's a lot of information. Um, you have a quiz due tonight. You're all working on your final projects. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you.